Hey everyone, thanks for your time on a holiday weekend. It's busy here following Artemis, at least what Artemis news we can. Starship flew again and completed its first flight test of the year, which is good news for Artemis 3, but now we wait to see about the future schedule. I think we're also going to be on Artemis 2 watch for the rest of the year. The NASA Exploration Ground Systems, Orion, and SLS workforce is always busy internally, but now the visible activities are increasing, and there's more to report this week. There's also the beginnings of a Boeing SLS production update, and a field trip to see RS-25 engine production by L3 Harris out here in the Los Angeles metro area. But the top story this week is the Starship test flight. SpaceX conducted a complete, successful 10th Starship flight test in the late afternoon on Tuesday, August 28th, beginning with liftoff from Starbase on the Mexican border at 6.30 p.m. local time. Starship flight tests in this phase of development are all about the data, and the highest priority test objective on this test flight was to test the ship during a guided re-entry from orbital velocity to a simulated landing spot. The successful test allowed them to gather data on the re-entry flight envelope of version 2 of the ship for the first time and different thermal protection options for the future, among other things. The live coverage from cameras inside and outside the ship was spectacular, as usual, with SpaceX being an industry leader in terms of providing the highest level of visibility into these flight tests as they occur. While the ship was in space, it also carried out a Starlink payload dispenser demonstration and a second Raptor in space restart demonstration, both of which were broadcast live. After the previous three flight tests ended prematurely, Tuesday's flight test gets Starship development back on track, but there's much less visibility into everything else they're doing, including where development is relative to upcoming major milestones. For NASA's exploration programs, better known as Artemis, SpaceX is developing a Starship lunar lander that will begin service on Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. NASA has Artemis 3 scheduled for mid-2027, only 22 months away. Although no one's interests seem to be aligned, for now the progress seen on this flight test gets SpaceX closer to their priority and to their Artemis 3 obligations. SpaceX is racing the calendar to be ready to launch a Starship to Mars in the next transfer window at the end of 2026, about a year from now. The ship is designed to be an upper stage and a spacecraft, kind of like space shuttle orbiters were, and the demonstrations are precursors to full upper stage capability. SpaceX will need to fully demonstrate both capabilities in the next year and more, including hours-long orbital flight like an upper stage and weeks-long orbital flight like a spacecraft. They will also need to demonstrate a working version of on-orbit refueling in order for a ship to go to Mars, which is a key working capability that NASA and Artemis need to send ships to the moon. SpaceX also needs to demonstrate an uncrewed lunar landing and then launch and refuel the second lunar lander flight article that Artemis 3 will use. Artemis 3 doesn't officially start until after that second crew-capable Starship lunar lander is loitering in lunar orbit. That second crewed Starship lunar lander will need to return the Artemis 3 crew from the moon back to Orion, which, in addition to loitering in orbit for up to 60 days, will require a larger fuel load. SpaceX has one more set of version 2 prototypes of the ship and booster they can fly, and that flight test is expected to be well before the end of this year. The next design iteration, version 3, is then expected to begin flying around the end of this year, beginning of 2026. With the visible activity and launch preparations continuing to increase, we're probably going to be on Artemis 2 watch most weeks. This week, NASA Kennedy Space Center Public Affairs posted a few images of Orion in the Launch Abort System facility, where the crew module is connected to and encapsulated by its Launch Abort System. These stills were taken on Wednesday, August 27th, showing the last tower stacked on the crew module. When I spoke with Matt Check, Expression Ground Systems Acting Senior Vehicle Operations Manager on the 22nd, he said they were looking to get into installing the OGI fairings as early as this past week. We took Orion over on the 10th um, this month, and have been basically the first thing we're going to do there is, is get the last um, attached, which it is at this point. Um, it's attached in radio, and then we're going into the, um, the I'll call it the, um, all 
the all the connects, the electrical connects between the, the last and the CM um, are in work now for the next couple of days, maybe a little bit in the next week, and then and then we really get into the meat of the the whole um, the whole setup of the last of um, is is installed no jet panels, which is basically everything you see on the outside of the vehicle, um, which you know encapsulate the the crew module. We can see that as of the time these pictures were taken on Wednesday, all four fairing panels were still staged on the floor of the LASIF, with the hatch panel looking like it might be in preps to be the first panel lifted. I posted the part one video of a two-parter covering the full interview with Mr. Check on Friday. That's the link in the upper right currently. But specifically talking about the work in the LASIF, he noted that installing and securing the four ogive-shaped fairing panels was considered the critical path in the LASIF. Yeah, so we look at it from a, more of a critical path perspective, right? And that critical path is getting those the ogives installed, and then the things you're alluding to are the are basically all the fasteners, right? So the, the ogives go on, and then um, there's a whole bunch of, and there's a number, I don't remember what it was, but it's a, it's a very large number of, of fasteners that, you know, attach each panel together um, on the sides and then the top and the bottom. And so Arduino's one, one of our biggest problems with it was, is the way that those fasteners, so, you know, fasteners, we think we have a better, better solution, better um, implementation there. And then over top of that, you know, for flight, for weatherproofing and for um, um, thermal, uh, aerothermal, they put a bunch of TPS over it. Um, so we did it for Artemis 1 in, in very, I'll call it thin layers, um, kind of alternating materials, but, but thin layers. Um, we found that that isn't necessarily required to do it that way. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot less layers, but thicker um, for this one. So, um, and the reason why that's important is every, every layer of something you put on has a cure time, a dry time, you know, um, where it's, it's on there and you're just waiting. After all four panels are lifted into place, additional fittings will be installed and the panels will be secured with all those fasteners. And then the room temperature vulcanizer, or RTV, will be applied. EGS is targeting an early October completion of the work in the LASIF, and then Orion would be rolled to the vehicle assembly building for stacking on SLS. Already stacked in the VAB, the SLS vehicle has completed all of its standalone testing and checkout. I got a chance to speak with Bill Muddle, lead RS-25 field engineer for L3 Harris, as a part of a visit to the L3 Harris Aerojet Rocketdyne facility in the Los Angeles metro area. More about that momentarily, but Mr. Muddle is out in Florida, where he supports operations at Kennedy Space Center, and I asked him about the status of the four RS-25 engines in the Artemis II vehicle. I mean, it sounds like the 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 P sets for the core stage are done, and I my understanding is that the the, the RS twenty five engine stuff was basically in there. Um, yeah. So you've got that done, and is is there any? I mean, is there any other? Are the engines basically ready to roll and ready for tanking? Uh, yes. So I mean, you know, P set is a, is a comprehensive test that we do on the engines, right? It's uh, we do controller and and sensor checkouts and pneumatic checkouts and we um you know we run hydraulics and do the actuator checkouts and we actually do a full you know uh we call it a flight readiness test or a simulation of the mission and we did all that stuff and um and we looked at the data and we compared the data against the other you know the previous times that these engines have run and it's they, they overlay right over each other so they, we didn't have any anomalies we didn't have any problems at all and this is really the last, that was the last big test for these engines before they roll out to the pad. And then um, the next thing we'd really do is, you know, we'll power the engines up and, um, you know, start doing the final checkouts of the engines and then get ready for tank. So we're, uh, you know, we're, we're done and ready to go to the pad. There was another interesting behind-the-scenes look at a mission simulation provided by the Artemis II flight crew. Commander Reed Weissman showed a video inside the Orion simulator in Building 5 at the Johnson Space Center, and we got a quick peek at one of the crew displays during a long simulation. These numbers won't be exactly the same from one run to the next, or the actuals in flight, but they are similar to the numbers I got almost two and a half years ago, and are probably still within the ballpark. We're looking at a point in the sim where the mission is a little bit less than two and a half hours from the translunar injection burn, the TLI burn. We can see that and the current mission elapsed time of 23 hours, 17 minutes, and 57 seconds. 
For Artemis II, Orion will basically finish the TLI burn after the SLS in space second stage, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, contributes a large part of it. We can see the current orbit, 38,441 by 101 nautical miles, which is about 71,193 by 187 kilometers. We can also see the TLI burn targets with a total delta V of 1,273.5 feet per second and a burn time of 5 minutes and 48 seconds. That would be about 388 meters per second. That's a useful ballpark reference for the mission about the magnitude and duration of the burn. For Artemis 1 and Artemis 3, where ICPS performs a complete TLI burn, the delta V is in the neighborhood of 3,000 meters per second. So that gives us a rough idea about how much ICPS contributes to the overall TLI on Artemis 2. For this mission, the long but not quite so long ICPS burn is called an Apogee Rays Burn, and that's essentially the 38,000 nautical mile or almost 72,000 kilometer Apogee that we see here. That puts the Orion and ICPS stack in an orbit with a period of about 24 hours. That's the second orbit of what turns out to be a three orbit but 10 day long mission. About halfway through that second orbit up at Apogee, Orion makes a perigee raise burn to bring the perigee back up to about 100 nautical miles or 185 kilometers. We can see in this simulation that the perigee is 101 after that burn. I got the opportunity to visit the L3 Harris Aerojet Rocketdyne facility in the Los Angeles metro area during the week for the first time since the COVID pandemic. A lot has changed, including that Aerojet Rocketdyne is now part of L3 Harris. They are the prime contractor for several engines used by the Orion and SLS programs, but the Canoga Park facility is now in full production mode for RS-25 engines. NASA contracted with now L3 Harris to deliver 24 new flight engines for use in four engine clusters on the SLS core stage. Formerly known as the Space Shuttle Main Engine, major production of flight engine hardware for use on the reusable Space Shuttle orbiters ended around the turn of the century, with shuttle program retirement about 15 years ago. The engine is composed of several line replacement units. In other words, many of the components were and are interchangeable. So production of the engines works that way too, with power heads and turbo pumps and combustion chambers and nozzles manufactured on their own timelines. Eventually, an engine kit is delivered to an L3 Harris facility at the Stennis Space Center in southern Mississippi, where they are in charge of final assembly, acceptance test, and storage and maintenance of completed RS-25 flight engines. NASA contracted with then Aerojet Rocketdyne to restart RS-25 production from scratch about 10 years ago, beginning with redesigning and requalifying engine builds using new manufacturing methods like additive manufacturing and methods used to build other engines such as the RS-68 and the J-2X. The engine has largely the same form, fit, and function as the SSME, but is operated at higher performance levels on the expendable SLS vehicle. A full component set or kit of 16 SSMEs and some spare inventory was relocated to Stennis from Kennedy Space Center after shuttle retirement, and in addition to production of new RS-25 engine hardware in Los Angeles and other facilities like in West Palm Beach, L3 Harris is also supporting current SLS operations, such as integrated simulations for the Artemis II launch. The contractor base for SLS and Orion will be on console in their own support rooms for the Artemis II launch and mission, and are available to work with the launch control and flight control teams during the flight test. In addition to supporting Artemis II, L3 Harris is ready to install the remaining SSMEs, now called RS-25 adaptation engines, in the Artemis III and Artemis IV core stages when those are completed. The SLS RS-25 engine, including restarted production, completed its design certification review over a year ago in July 2024, and during a tour of the LA Metro facility, I saw a lot of RS-25 flight hardware in various phases of production, with larger components more obvious than others. I saw 10 or 11 nozzles being worked on, and half a dozen powerheads. In addition, three full engine sets have already been shipped to Stennis. 
The first flight engine, engine 20001, was quietly acceptance tested at Stennis in June. L3 Harris is in final assembly for the second engine and has the part set for the third on site to begin final assembly for that. They are ramping production to deliver four flight engines per year, but they could have the first set of new engines for Artemis V tested and in storage by 2027, with Artemis V right now projected early in the next decade. There's a lot to digest from the visit and from an interview there about all the RS-25 engine program work, from supporting Artemis II operations, to getting ready to install engines for Artemis III and IV, to engine production for Artemis V and beyond. So I hope to have more in future videos. At the end of the week, I got the latest monthly update from Boeing on their SLS production. I'll go through it in more detail in an upcoming video, but a couple of takeaways. Big picture like L3 Harris with the RS-25 engines, Exploration Ground Systems and Launch Processing Prime Contractor Amentum are in charge of Artemis II at this point, with the Prime Contractors for Orion and SLS providing support. Those Prime Contractors, like Boeing with the SLS stages, are in charge of production of flight hardware for Artemis III and beyond. For Core Stage 3 and Artemis 3, engine section integration continues now in VAB High Bay 2, where it is now set up in the Core Stage Vertical Integration Center. NASA's last schedule update was that the engine section would be ready for the final mate with the rest of the stage in the spring. That would mean that the element is fully outfitted and fully checked out by then. They are still waiting for critical hydraulic systems parts to be delivered for installation though. The rest of the stage is still at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. The liquid oxygen tank sump is now installed and the tank has been moved to another processing cell in Building 103 after it was rotated back to horizontal. It is being prepared for the forward join with the inner tank and forward skirt and Boeing is completing standalone functional testing of those two elements before stacking. Thanks for watching. Now that SpaceX has a new flight data set, the big question returns to their Starship critical path and their Artemis 3 schedule. Like and subscribe if you find these videos informative and want to find out if SpaceX says anything about that and everything that's going on with Artemis every week. As usual, a big thanks to the members of this YouTube channel who are helping to make it possible to keep doing these videos. I am posting additional content and more frequent updates if you're interested in joining. If you're interested in making a one-time donation to support what I do, I would also really appreciate it. I put a link to my Buy Me A Coffee page in the description. Thanks again as always, and I'll see you next time.